Okay, that is the recording started and without further ado, I will uh, introduce my, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Pradis. He is a senior lecturer at uh, the Open University and he's going to talk to you a little bit about chaos theory and the butterfly effect. So over to you, Mark. Hey, thank you very much, Andrew. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Mark Pradas, and I'm a senior lecturer in applied mathematics at the Open University. And in this session, we'll be talking about chaos theory and the butterfly effect. Chaos theory is actually a very important branch in mathematics that describes many phenomena that is relevant to real world uh, applications, including in physics, chemistry, engineering, and biology. And the aim of this session is to show you, uh, to some extent, and within some simple examples, the mathematics that are behind chaos theory. So I may ask you some questions during this session, and you might find it useful if you have a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. So the first thing we should, uh, I'm going to talk about is, well, let's try to, to define what is chaos. And chaos is actually a word that is, we use very commonly in, in our uh, vocabulary, particularly to describe situations that refer to complete disorder and confusion. For example, if I show you these images of a very messy and disordered rooms, storage room or an office, one of the things that, one of the words that come into our mind to describe this is usually chaotic. There's a lot of chaos in these rooms. Other examples, the classical examples that where you will see the, the use of word chaos, particularly in the headlines of the news, is when there is problems on train stations, airports, there might be some delays or some issues that cause accumulation of people. And normally when we look at this image, we'll think that there's a lot of chaos and these are chaotic scenes. So this is the way we, this, we use the word chaos in the common daily life experiences. However, in mathematics, when we talk about chaos, we normally we refer to something slightly different, although it's related to this idea of being disordered and confusing in a way. But in mathematics, when we talk about chaos, we mean that a chaotic systems are characterized by a very particular type of motion, type of movement. And a chaotic motion is characterized by being erratic, irregular, and it's also very unpredictable. Another possible definition within mathematics of chaos is the ability of simple models, that is simple systems, to generate highly complicated and complex behavior. And I'm gonna show you several examples in this session that exhibit this type of uh, behavior. But perhaps the best way to understand and to have the first encounter about chaos is to show you some examples. One of them is not chaotic and the other one, it is chaotic. So let's start with a very simple mechanical system, which is not chaotic, and is something that we are all actually quite familiar with. So here I'm showing you an example of a single pendulum, and this is uh, an experiment I did earlier at home. So basically this mechanical system consists of a single bar, which is attached, attached to this fixed point here, and it can move around this fixed point. So when I lift it to the left, as you can expect, and you let it go, it goes from left to right, left to right. I'm playing this movie in a slow motion with the hope that the motion will be a smooth and it comes across well through this uh, zoom platform. But the idea is that uh, periodic motion, uh, the idea is that the single pendulum exhibits what is known as periodic motion, which is a uh, well-defined and regular motion. And it's very predictable. So we know that if it starts from the left, you go to the right and so on and so on. So this, even though it's a very simple type of motion, and again, it's not chaotic, it's very well behaved, regular. This type of motion is actually observed in many other and many daily, daily life experiences. For example, here I'm showing you some instances where we observe periodic and well behaved motion. The motion of the moon around the planet Earth is an example of periodic motion, is repeating in time. Another example of a single pendulum is actually the motion of a swing in the playground, or a rocking chair, or the, or the strings of an instrument vibrating. All of these are examples of uh, well-behaved, regular and repeating motion over time. 
So now let me show you an example of something that is not periodic and it is actually chaotic. So let's complicate this mechanical system a little bit more and let's add in what in mathematics, mathematics is another degree of freedom. So I'm gonna modify this mechanical system to add this second bar, which now can move along this point with respect to the first bar. We have still the same black bar here, which moves around the fixed, the, this, the same fixed point. And then we have this yellow bar that can move along the point at the end of the black bar. This is what is known as a double pendulum. And I'm gonna show you what happened when you lift it and then you let it go. Again, I'm playing this in a slow motion. So you can see that the black bar goes left, right, more or less, but the yellow bar is actually doing quite, well, erratic and not periodic motion. Sometimes it spins to the left, sometimes it spins to the right, sometimes it spins once, twice, and it does this in a very unpredictable way. So it'd be very difficult to say where, it's gonna, where it is going to go based on what we are observing. So this is an example of irregular motion. And I'm going to show you that actually is chaotic as well. But this type of irregular motion are also observed in many daily life experiences. For example, here I'm, show, I'm showing you a common situation where you observe the, this type of irregular motion, for example, a falling leaf or billiard boards hitting with each other. Or classically, uh, an example of something that is very regular is the motion of the atmosphere. And here on the bottom row, I'm showing you the motion of uh, water coming out from the top, which again is a classic example of irregular motion. So chaotic motion is characterized first for being irregular, but secondly, it has another important feature. And this important feature is what is known as, it has a strong sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. And let me show you an example and illustrate what do we mean by this. So now I'm going to show you again another uh, homemade experiment where what we have here is actually two double pendulums. So we can see one in front of each other. They are independent from each other and the motion of one doesn't affect the motion of the other one. This device was actually built in the, in the School of Engineering uh, and Innovation at the Open University. And it was built precisely to illustrate this phenomenon of a strong sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. So what, what I did here is, what I'm going to show you now is an experiment where I try to start these two double pendula. I'll try to put them from the same location uh, and I'll, let's see what happens. We can see that the both double pendula, initially they follow the same type of oscillations, but after two or three seconds, now they are each of them is following a completely different type of uh, pattern. Well, both of them are oscillating, but they are not already, uh, they are not doing it uh, in sync anymore. So you can see that now the, the one in the front, for example, is spinning to the left and the other one to the right and so on. So this is an example of a sensitive dependence on initial condition and is an important feature of chaos. Here in this experiment, I tried as hard as I could to start from this exactly the same location. But actually, if I try to do, repeat this experiment and try to uh, place the both pendula starting from the same location, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play now two experiments, one side by side. And let's see, and we'll see that even though I try to start from the same location, we will observe that eventually both double pendula start to exhibit to display different, what in mathematics we would call trajectories. So we can see that actually the one on the right, it took longer for both pendulum to separate and to exhibit a different uh, motion. So this is a clear um, uh, manifestation on what in chaos theory is known as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And it's an important feature and a defining property of chaotic motion. So, well, that's what's the idea of this session. Uh, well, uh, before, before moving uh, to the next point, let me take this experiment that I made at home, to me, let me take it to the next level, because basically when I was trying to do this at home, 
obviously I try to start the, all the pendulum from the same position, but that's diff very difficult because I don't have very strong accuracy on my, on my hand holding the pendulum. So I'm gonna show you now a com uh, computer generated animation, which tries to model this motion of double pendulum. And now what I'm gonna show you is that actually in this animation, there are 10 double pendula. And if you look uh, one in front of each other, and all of them are starting almost exactly from the same location, but they are different from a very small fraction of an angle. So let's see what happened in this computer generated animation of this experiment I was doing at home. So now we have 10 double pendulum. Initially, they are all following the same trajectory. We cannot distinguish one from another. But now we can see that all of them start to unfold and then they exhibit these completely different trajectories now. And now is what you could say, well, this is very uh, chaotic. So it's completely unpredictable. And it's rather mesmerizing as well. So what's the idea of this session? So I have shown you that chaotic motion is characterized by first being irregular type of motion, and second, having this strong sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. And I have shown you two types of motion, one which is periodic, and the other one is not, is chaotic. So the idea is that I'm gonna to try to show you the mathematics that describe this type of systems. And the tools and mathematical methods that we use uh, to describe this are taken from a very important branch of mathematics that is known as dynamical systems theory. Generally speaking, a dynamical system it's a mathematical model that describes and studies changes in time of a given quantity. For example, we might want to quantify how the angle of one of these bars of like of the single pendulum or the double pendulum evolves in time. And I'd like to make two remarks here. The first one is that these type of dynamical systems in general are described with what is known as differential equations, which I'm not going to uh, talk about it in this session because it would go beyond the scope of the session. And perhaps depending on the level of mathematics you are currently in, you, you might have already encountered examples of differential equations. But I can tell you that if you are interested in pursuing a, uh, a degree in applied mathematics, physical engineering, you are very much likely to encounter and study in detail differential equations. But generally speaking, a, a differential equation is a equation that describes the rate of changes of a quantity. But in this session, we're gonna follow a different approach when we try to mathematically model these changes in time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, follow a more, more simplistic approach based on sequence of numbers. And this will, be, this will lead to the introduction of a very important types of uh, sequence of numbers that that generated by what is known as the logistic map, which we'll talk about in quite detail in this session. And I will show you that this uh, equation I'm showing you here actually describes the time evolution of a fish population. Actually, it could be of any animal population based on very simple rules. The other important point to remark about dynamical systems, and that's important in chaos theory, in, is that the dynamical system is what is known deterministic and they are in principle predictable. This means that if we know exactly the initial condition, because we know the mathematical model that describes the time evolution of the system, we can predict the future based on the initial conditions. And this is what we're referring to as being deterministic in mathematics. But this idea of being deterministic will, will be challenged by the concept I was introducing you earlier, this concept of sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. So the second point I want to discuss in this talk is what are the consequences of this sensitive dependence on the initial conditions in dynamical systems. And I will show you that this is commonly known as the butterfly effect. We'll learn why we call it the butterfly effect. And finally, and very briefly, I'm gonna try to uh, show you the connection between uh, chaotic motion, that is this irregular and erratic motion with these uh, geometrical objects known as fractal. And I'm showing you here at the bottom uh, right, an example of a very famous fractal known as the Mandelbrot set. So the idea is that even though the chaotic systems exhibit this type of irregular 
and very unpredictable motion, there is an underlying order characterized in terms of this uh, object known as fractals. So the, my main goal here is try to show you what's the connection between a fish population, a butterfly, these beautiful objects known as fractals, and how all of this is connected to through this uh, very simple equation known as the logistic map. Okay, so the first thing we need to, uh, to, uh, to learn is about how can we mathematically model uh, changes in time of a quantity. And to do this, let me go back to the first experiment I show you. I'm going to show you a computerly com uh, uh, computer generated simulation of a single pendulum. And let's have a look at the angle of this pendulum with respect to the vertical axis. And let's say that we're going to measure the position of to be at the right and to be at the left. And then I'm going to play this movie. And so the pen single pendulum goes from right to left, right to left. And at this point, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. So the first question is, if I give you this a graph where the vertical axis describes the evolution, the angle of the single pendulum, and for simplicity, for uh, let's assume that the right position is denoted by plus one, and the left position is denoted by minus one. So on the vertical axis, we have the angle, and on the horizontal axis, we have time. So my first question would be, could you sketch uh, the time evolution of the angle, given this vertical ac this, uh, this, uh, axis? And the second question, could you give me, or could you say what kind of mathematical function would be able to describe this time evolution? Uh, feel free to type the answer on the webinar chat box. I'll give you a few seconds to think about. We are looking for a mathematical function that can describe this periodic motion in time. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing some, some answers already in the chat. Indeed, yeah, this is a very simple motion. And uh, well, I can show you the numerical result or the computer generated result of this uh, movie, which as you might expect, the, uh, the evolution is a simple sine wave, which we can represent with a cosine function. So this uh, uh, function basically actually reproduces how the angle evolves in time continuously and how it changes from left to right, left to right. However, in, in uh, the approach we'll be following in this session, will be a slightly different and we'll, following, we'll be following a slightly simple, much more simple approach, which is instead of looking at the continuous time evolution of the angle, we're going to take measurements at fixed points separated by constant time intervals. And then we are going to write a sequence of these measurements. So let's imagine that we take the measurement, the, the measurement of the angle when it's at the right and then when it's on the left, and then when it's on the right, left, right again. So this is, these measurements are separated by constant time intervals. And now let's remove and let's forget about this continuous time evolution described by this solid red line. And let's focus on these points here. I hope that you will agree that this sequence of dots actually that tells right, left, right, left, they are actually enough to tell us that the motion behind this sequence is periodic because a periodic motion, which is basically repeating in time, is described in terms of a sequence of numbers where the values alternating between two values. And this, in this case, we have the sequence that is one minus one, one minus one, minus one, minus one, and so on. And there's a very simple mathematical rule that describes this sequence. So if you are on the left, you go to the right, and you are on the right, you go to the left. So that's an example of how can we quantify the time evolution with a sequence of numbers. And in this case, it's very simple because it's just a periodic repetitive motion. But now let's have a look and then let's repeat this uh, experiment uh, with the chaotic motion. So now let's do the same. So I'm going to play a, a computer generated animation of a double pendulum. Let's measure the angle and let's try to uh, 
well, if I give you again the same axis, would you be able to uh, sketch the evolution of this angle now versus time? And would you be able to find a mathematical function that describes this evolution? Well, in this case, it will be much more difficult. As you can see now, the angle sometimes goes all the way to the left, sometimes goes all the way to the right. Some other times it stays halfway through. And so, so if you were to try to sketch a graph in this axis, probably you end up, you would end up with a rather wiggly and fluctuating shape of a function. I'm just looking at the chat box. There is a question regarding whether it's periodic as it is regular and predictable. Uh, the answer is that when a motion is periodic, it means that it's regular. And in this, and then uh, because it's regular, it means that it's repeating in time and therefore it is predictable. So the answer is yes. When we talk about periodic motion, essentially we think about regular and predictable motion. Although the concept of predictability, we'll come back to this uh, in much more detail in a few slides. But for now, let's say that periodic is regular, well-behaved, and it's easy to predict. So in this case, the case the, for a double pendulum, I'm gonna show you the evolution of the angle. As you can see now, it's much more complicated. And in fact, there is no simple mathematical function that describes this, that this evolution. But we're going to follow uh, the same approach as we did in the cosine function. And we're gonna take measurements at finite and a specific points in time, which in this case corresponds to these blue dots along time. And now let's remove this uh, red solid line. And again, we are left with a sequence of points which again, we can already see that from this sequence of points that we are dealing with a dynamics that is irregular because these points are not repeating. We cannot really see a pattern in time. And uh, we, have much, we have simplified the uh, description of this in mathematical terms because now we are just dealing, instead of dealing with a continuous function, we are dealing with a sequence of numbers. In this case, it would be like we start from one, then we go to minus one and then to 1.1 minus 0 0.8 and so on and so on. So as we can see, the numbers don't seem to repeat. However, uh, if we had a mathematical rule that can generate this sequence, we could in principle predict what is the next uh, value in the sequence. So that's the idea of this, uh, uh, of this deterministic dynamical system. So this idea of having a mathematical root, rule that can predict the future leads to this concept of deterministic dynamical system. And now coming back to the question that I spoke in the chat is whether it's predictable. The idea is that any dynamical system that is deterministic in principle is always predictable as long as you have the starting point and you know the mathematical rules that, uh, that govern the system. Basically, if you, know, if you have a mathematical model that can describe the time evolution. So, that, so basically what we <coughs> have is the following. We have a starting point, which is the present. Then let's assume that we know the mathematical rules of the model. And with this, we can predict the future, which is basically the next point in the sequence of numbers. So from this, we can apply again, the same mathematical rules to predict the, sec the next point in the, in the sequence. And so if you repeat this process, you can generate a sequence of numbers. So this in mathematics is what is known as an iterative map. And the goal when you deal with these deterministic dynamical systems is essentially to create a sequence of numbers that represent the time evolution of something. In the previous examples I showed you earlier, so this time evolution was the evolution of the angle of the single pendulum or of the double pendulum. And this was mathematically modeled in terms of a sequence of numbers. So the key point here is that if we know the mathematical rules, in principle, we can predict the future. And that's the idea behind deterministic. Okay, so let's try to now quantify and put all these concepts into more mathematical terms. So first, we're gonna take that the, the values of the sequence, we're gonna to re refer to these values as X. So X naught is the first value of the sequen sequence. Then we apply a mathematical rule to get the next value, which is we denote as X1. So then from X1, we apply the same mathematical rule to get X2. From X2, we get X3 and so on. 
So we create this sequence of numbers up to a point, point xn, which is when we stop this sequence, uh, this iteration uh, with the mathematical rule. For example, let's say that the mathematical rule is multiply x by two. So if we're starting from x not equal to one, the next value in the sequence will, will be one times two, x one will be two. And now the next one, we apply again the same mathematical rule, which is multiplied by two. So two times two, four. And then if you continue like this, you will get four, eight, 16, 32, and so on and so on. But importantly to know is that if we start from a different initial point, we can still apply the same mathematical rule, but we will get a different sequence of numbers. So if we start, for example, for three, from three, we'll get three, six, 12, and so on and so on. So this is a very simple mathematical rule. So now the idea is that we want to put these words that we said multiply x by two in, in mathematical terms. And so this is the generic mathematical expression of this type of sequence. So we are dealing with the following. So x n plus one refers to the next point in the sequence, which is given in terms of the previous value x n. And this f function here represents this mathematical rule that I was referring to earlier. And we'll start, we'll refer to these points in the sequence as n starting from zero, one, two, three, and so on and so on. For example, in the previous example, that was multiply x by two, the mathematical function is just two times x n. So that when you, if you apply this mathematical function at n equal to zero, you'll get x one equal to two x zero, x two equal to x one and so on and so on. Okay, so at this point it might be worth uh, asking another question. Hope so far more or less everything is clear. So perhaps I, I would like to ask, if I give you this sequence of numbers, could you tell me uh, the mathematical function that describes this sequence of numbers? We don't need to go over all of them in the spirit of time, but if you can try to think one of them, what is the mathematical function that governs this sequence of numbers? Or in other words, what operation you need to do to the first value, one in this case, to get three, and what the same operation needs to be applied to three to get five, and so on and so on, and the same for the other sequences. Could you tell me what mathematical function is describing each sequence or one of the sequences? I'll give you some a few moments to think about it. I'm seeing some answers. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, I think we have seen we have some answers in the chat box. I'm just gonna show you the solutions. In the first one, you can see that you have one if you add two. One plus two, you get three. Three plus two, you get five. Five plus two, seven, and so on. So the mathematical rule is that you need to add two to the previous value. So this is given as fx equal to xn plus two. The, on the b, well, I'm just going to give you, you can see that uh, if you multiply the first one by two and then subtract one, you will get this. Uh, from two, you get three. From three, you get five. From five, five, point five times two, 10 minus one, nine, and so on and so forth. And finally, the last one, it's you multiply by three and then you add one. And you can see that you can generate all these numbers. Okay, so this is just to show you some examples of this type of iterative maps, which remember that the goal here is we're going to be using this mathematical expression to represent things that change in time. And the examples I have shown you so far are to what is known as linear maps, because basically the function that describes the iteration, it's a linear function. And here I'm just showing you the generic 
expression for the linear function where a and b are just constant parameters. For example, here I'm showing you a graph of a linear function, which as you can see is a simple straight line of the function 2x plus 1. <clears throat> so this is examples of a linear functions, but these are the most, the simplest uh, iterations that you can think of. But to create this kind of irregular and complicated chaotic motion, what we need, we will need some more complex type of functions, more, uh, not complex, more, uh, uh, in, let's say more difficult functions, although, and we will, basically what we need is some nonlinear effects. And this is described by nonlinear functions, which basically the definition of a nonlinear function is a function that is not linear. And the type of function that we will see in this, uh, in this session are basically nonlinear functions that involve powers other than one. This could be, for example, a quadratic function or a cubic function. And then here, again, I'm showing you an example, a graph of a quadratic, the, the simple quadratic function. Okay, so I have shown you now this, the way of generating a sequence of numbers through these iterative maps. We have seen linear and nonlinear functions. So now I think we are ready to introduce uh, the main equation that we will be looking at during this session. And that's what is known as the logistic map, which as I will show you now, it's one of the, perhaps one of the most important equations in mathematics to some people, according to some people. So this equation, uh, was actually introduced by a biologist, uh, Robert May, who uh, sadly actually passed away this uh, last April. And he was working, trying to, to uh, come up with a mathematical model that describes the evolution, the evolution of an imaginary population of fish. And this is what, uh, so let's, let's see what are the main rules and the main idea behind this mathematical formulation. So let's imagine that we have a large fish, po fish population in a lake. And when I say a lake, we mean that we are dealing with a closed environment. That's an important point to note. And let's say that we count the number of fishes from year to year. So for example, in the year one, we have uh, four fishes. In the next year, we have more fishes. So here there is three, uh, nine fishes. In year three, we have more. There has been a, a, a growth in the fish population. And in the four year, this population has kept increasing. And then we have recorded all this number of fishes every year. So we can assume that there's a maximum population that can fit within the lake. So that's why I mean that there's a closed environment. So we cannot fit more than a finite number. And now we're gonna define a variable X, which will be denoting this sequence of numbers. And this X variable is the population at the nth year divided by the maximum population. So essentially we're looking at the percentage of population with respect to the maximum capacity of the lake. So as you can see, when X is zero, it means that there is no fishes. And when X is equal to one, it means that the lake is full of fishes and we are at full capacity. So with this, uh, so basically if you look at now the four examples I was showing you earlier, so that X naught would be like, say 8%, X1 would be 18%, 0.18, X2 0.3, and X3 0.4, and so on and so on. So the sequence of numbers that we'll be looking at in this model are basically sequence of numbers that are with, between zero and one and represent the percentage of fish population with respect to the full capacity. So with this idea, now we can uh, state the main assumptions of the model so that we can construct the mathematical uh, equation that describes the evolution of this, this population. And this is based in basically in two main ingredients. The first ingredient is that we can assume that there is the uh, fish population can be created at a given birth rate, as well as can uh, the fish population can also die at a given death rate. And the difference between the birth and that death rate will be controlled by this parameter that we denote as R. So that's the first ingredient. So there is birth and death rates. And the second important uh, ingredient is that we can assume that because we are dealing with a closed environment, there may be some overcrowding. 
And as a consequence of this, the fish population uh, can shrink because pe uh, fishes will be dying as a consequence of overcrowding. So with these two ingredients, essentially, uh, we can, uh, Robert May suggested the following mathematical iterative map to describe the evolution of the fish population. And we can see that actually this equation uh, uh, includes these two, uh, these two assumptions. If you look at the first one, this term here, which is basically a linear term in the equation, if we ignore the other part. So it's R times X. So this would be like if we were only to include the first assumption that there is birth and death rate, which is controlled by the parameter R, this would be given by this linear term. And so if R is larger than one, which means that the, the birth rate is larger than the death rate, in that case, the fish population would be just incre increasing, increasing indefinitely over time. But this cannot be possible because we are dealing with a closed environment. So that's why we need to introduce this second term here, which is one minus X. And as you can see, when X approaches one, which is when X approaches the full capacity of the lake, we are dealing with problems with overcrowding. And so this term becomes very small. And so now the population will start to shrink to compensate this overcrowding effect. So combining both effects is when we retain these main ingredients in the assumption of the mathematical model. So we can rearrange this equation to write it in this form, which is the more standard form that you will see the logistic map written. And we can see that this basically we have uh, this type of iterative maps to create sequence of numbers. And we have a function that is a quadratic function. I can show you a graph of this function. As you, you can recognize it's a quadratic function. It's characterized by this main single hump where there's a maximum at x one half and this function is zero at x equal to zero and x equal to one. Okay, now, so now let's explore in detail this equation here. And I'm gonna show you this equation, even though it's very simple, it's actually gonna show very remarkable results. And in fact, some people have said that this equation is the most beautiful equation in mathematics. And the reason behind this strong statement is because when we change and we look at in, in detail the evolution of this fish population and we iterate this iterative map, depending on the value of this parameter R, this simple model gives rise to a, a very wide range of different behaviors, including fixed points. It also leads to periodic changes in the fish population and also importantly leads to this chaotic erratic motion as we will discover now with some uh, explorations. So let's have a look and see what happens when we look at this equation for different values of R. So at this point, if there is any question, please feel free to ask this question at the chat. So let's start considering a case where R is less than one. So for example, R equal to 0.5. And let's consider initial population of x naught equal to 0 0.3. So because r is less than one, this means that essentially the death rate is much higher than the birth rate. So intuitively you might expect that eventually this population will just die out as a consequence of higher death rates. But let's see what happens when you do it numerically, when you try to iterate this, this by following the rules of this uh, logistic map. So we start x naught equal to 0 0.3, and then we have R equal to 0 0.5. So what we do just to follow the rules, so the next one will be 0 0.5 times 0 0.3 minus 0 0.3 squared. We're just following this simple iteration rule given by the logistic map. So we find that X1 is 0 0.105. So now we repeat the same to get the next one. So, and now we put into the equation, we put the previous value X1. So it's what we find here in X2 is equal to 0 0.5 times this function F uh, applied to 0 0.105. And we find another value. We repeat again for X3 and again for X4 and we stop here. So we have created a sequence of numbers representing the fish population for four years. So we can say that after four years, the, the population has decreased 
And for example, if the maximum population was 10,000 fishes, this means that initially there were 3,000 fishes, and after four years, there's only around over 100 left. So this, uh, these kind of sequences of numbers that we plot x0, x1, x2, and so on, we can actually also plot it in a graph. And this is what I'm showing in this graph here. So on the vertical axis, we plot the population x at different iterations. And on the horizontal axis, we plot each iteration. So we start from n equal to zero, and we have the initial position. In the previous example, I showed you that initially we had 0 0.3, but you could try a an different initial position, for example, 0 0.8. And what we are observing that in both cases, the fish population decreases to zero after five, six iterations is nearly zero. So we can conclude that when r uh, is less than one, and you can try this, you can try any value for r less than one, the population always decreases to zero. It doesn't matter uh, the value of r as long as it's less than one. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we go beyond r larger than one. Actually, what you see is that uh, uh, when r is between one and three, what we observe is that the population always approaches a fixed point. It's not zero, but approaches a fixed, uh, stable uh, point where basically the population does not change in time. I'm showing you again this type of graphs I was showing in a previous example. This for different values of r. You can see that in all cases, all of them are starting from the same initial location, initial uh, value, 0 0.3. After five, six iterations, all of them have approached a constant value. And this constant value depends on the particular value of R. So we can see that between one and three, the population always approaches a fixed point uh, that depends on this parameter R. Another point, um, point to remark is that this final state, it's insensitive to the initial conditions. So this means that if you keep the value of R constant, and then you change the initial locations, initial values of the, of the sequence, all of them eventually will approach the same value. And this is important to remember that under these conditions, when R is less than three, this system is insensitive to initial condition. It doesn't matter where we start from. It always ends to the same population. So what happens when R is larger than three? So let's see, let's consider R 3.1, an initial condition of X naught equal to 0 0.2. So now let's repeat again this, uh, this process of creating the sequence of numbers. So X naught is 0 0.2. Then we have X1 will be 3.1 times 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2 squared, which gives 0 0.496. And now we can repeat this several times, X2, X3, X4, X5. And we can continue repeating this. I'm going to do it until x10. And uh, maybe perhaps I could ask, can you see any something, something remarkable, something that it's noticeable when you look at this sequence of numbers? Can you see any pattern? Yes. Exactly. So we can see that there is a repetition here. If you look at the first uh, at two at the uh, two uh, significant significant figures, we see that this 76, 55, 76, 55, 76. And now, if you if we plot this sequence in these graphs I was showing you earlier, we can see we can clearly see now that the the population alternates between two values. And this is actually something observed in uh, nature. It's it's observed that. Uh, animal populations can exhibit these cycles where they, there is a shrinking and growing uh, populations and they are alternating between these, between two uh, values. But looking at this graph, does this remind you of the first movie I showed you at the beginning, this kind of uh, the single pendulum. Remember that when we try to quantify this mathematically, we got this sequence of two values. So this is showing us that this logistic map when you tune the parameter R correctly, it leads to this periodic motion where the sequence is characterized by two values that are being repeated over and over. So basically, 
the population it repeats every two every other value. So that's what happens actually when uh, and important to remind again is that this periodic the two values of this periodic pattern depend on the particular value of r but they do not depend on the initial conditions. Again, we are dealing with something that is insensitive to initial conditions. And for example, in this graph, I started from 0 0.6, I would end up on the same two values after 10, 15 iterations. So what we observe is that when R is actually between three and around 3.45, the population alternates between two values. So we have periodic motion so what happens when we keep increasing R? So now things is when it starts to get interesting. When R is between 3.45 and 3.54, the population now alternates between four values. Perhaps it's not clear from this image, but if I highlight these four values here, you can see that four of, uh, all of them are different, but they are exactly the same as the next four. And they are exactly the name, same as the next four. So this is showing us that there's still periodic motion, but now the values are repeating every four iterations. Before it was every two iterations, now it's every four iterations. So this is what you observe when R is between these two values, 3.45 and 3.54. Now if you keep increasing R, what you actually observe is that between 3.54 and 3.5699, you see a sequence of changes in which the population first alternates between eight values, then between uh, 16, and then every 32 values and so on, then 64 and so on and so on. And when you reach the value, it's a critical value of 3.5699, and you go just over this value, what you will observe is that you have chaotic motion. You can see now this sequence of numbers that they are never repeating. And does this uh, graph here, does it remind you to something? perhaps to the uh, double pendulum I show you at the very beginning. You can see that basically we are dealing with the same type of uh, non-repetitive irregular sequence of numbers. And this is given by this logistic map. But remember that the key point here is that we know how to generate this sequence. We know what will be the next value after 50 because we have the mathematical rule to predict the next point. So the important thing about this is that this simple mathematical model, the logistic map, is able to induce this highly irregular and non-repeating sequence of numbers. So from this graph, you can see that we have irregular motion, but it is truly chaos. So to, do, to show that it's chaos, we need to show that it's a strongly sensitive, uh, it has a strong sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. So we're gonna do basically a simple experiment where we start from different initial conditions, 0 0.9195, 0 0.2, and all of this here. And now you repeat, you create a sequence of numbers. And as you can see that after 10 iterations or so, all the numbers actually are different from each other. They are still cl close from each other, but actually we started, uh, uh, the numbers initially were not from different, not too different from each other. So we can also plot this in a graph. And you can see now clearly see that initially both all of them kind of follow the same sequence, but then after eight, nine iterations, now we have completely different uh, values in the sequences. So if this is not convincing enough, you can do another numerical experiment. So this you can create, for example, you can start two sequences, one with 0 0.2 and the other one with 0 0.20001. So it's a very tiny initial difference. And you can see now that initially, both sequences are the same. You cannot really distinguish between the blue and the red one. But after 25, 26 iterations, they start to exhibit completely different uh, values in the sequence. And again, does this remind you of something? I think we have already seen this in this numerical, in this computational movie that I show you about double pendulums. Initially, all of them follow the same behavior and after some time, all of them follow completely different trajectories. So similarly, this simple logistic map is uh, exhibiting this type of irregular, strongly sensitive dependent on the initial conditions. 
So just to put this in context, this is quite remarkable because imagine that we have a starting population, we have a population of 20,000 fishes and we have two lakes, one with 20,000 and another one with 20,000 plus one. And both of the lakes are following the same logistic map. So what it is telling us is that after 30 years, out of the blue, both the, both populations will be completely different and uh, the number of fishes will be completely different on each lake. So this is telling us that very tiny, small initial perturbations in your conditions can lead to very widely different behavior down in the future. And this is what commonly now is known as the butterfly effect. The idea that very small changes in the initial conditions produce widely varying and unpredictable responses. Okay, so hopefully I have shown you that this logistic map, even though it's very simple, is able to reproduce a very, uh, a very complex and very uh, wide range of different behaviors. And uh, now I'm gonna tidy up this picture. I'm gonna show you one last remark, which basically uh, show you one very last striking feature about, about this model which is the following. So let's, let's try to summarize what we have seen so far. So we have seen that depending on the value of R, we have different behaviors going from zero populations, fixed points, periodic motion, and then chaotic. So let's try to plot these, all these behaviors in a graph in the following way. So in the vertical axis, I'm gonna show you the final state of the fish population, so X. And on the horizontal axis, we plot the parameter R. So this in mathematics is what is known as a bifurcation diagrams, but I'm not gonna go into the details of this. But essentially we know that when R is less than three, the fish population approaches a fixed point. And, that, and this fixed point is given by this uh, single line represented here. And you can see that the final state depends on R. And for example, when uh, R was uh, 2.5, which is around this point here, the final state is around 0 0.6, which is the one on the vertical axis around, around this point here. We already seen this. So now when we go beyond R equal to three, what we saw is that there is this periodic motion. Now the final two states, the final states basically is alternating between two values. And these two values depend on R. I'm showing you here the example of the graph where the fish population alternates between both values. And then as you keep increasing R, this, uh, each of these branches splits into two more values, giving rise to this full uh, periodic pattern. And then each of these, which is the graph I showed you earlier, and now if you keep increasing R, each of these four uh, branches will split again in two, giving again to a, uh, a eight periodic uh, pattern. And if you keep increasing R, it will get the critical point and when it becomes chaos, that you get is the following. You can see now the emergence of this striking image, which represents the chaotic motion of this irregular sequence of numbers. So let's say that, for example, R is 3.6. We can see that uh, the sequence of numbers is given by this, uh, by this uh, completely irregular number of uh, values. And because for a fixed value of R, there is an infinitely, infinitely dense number of points. We can see that this leads to this irregular and non-repeating sequence of numbers. Yeah, there is a question on the uh, on the chat box. Could you say each of these branches is a different timeline created from each event or action? Yeah. So for uh, basically what we do to create these uh, branches, if we fix R, and then we generate we repeat uh, and uh, we generate a sequence of numbers and we see the final state of this sequence of numbers. And then we plot this final state in the uh, vertical axis. And then we keep doing this for all the values of R. And this leads to this bifurcation and this, all these different branches. I hope this clarifies your question, but let me know if there is anything that is not clear yet. So one final remark about this image is that now if we imagine that we take this corner, this uh, section here and we zoom into this section, 
we can recognize that actually there's the same pattern as in the in the whole picture that we are showing in, the, in this bigger image here. We can see one branch splits into two, the other one splits into two again, and then another one, and then eventually evolves into this chaotic uh, image here. And now if we zoom in again here, I'm not gonna show you the actual image, but the idea is that you'll be uh, observing again the same image. And so on, so on, and so on, and so on. So this is an example of what is known as self-similar image, because when we zoom into the image, it just the image keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. So this is an example of what in mathematics geometrically is known as fractal. And uh, there are several examples of this. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details about fractals because this would require a whole session, but just show me some examples that fractals is these beautiful geometrical objects that appear in nature. For example, in branching processes, snowflakes, coastlines, cloud formation. They are this self-similar, so this image that are repeating itself when you zoom into the object. Again, you can also generate this in the computer uh, by creating this uh, sequence of numbers, by following uh, uh, iterative processes like the one I was describing you earlier. You can generate these beautiful images uh, that correspond to different examples of fractals. So the idea here, when we look at this type of graphs from the logistic map, is that when we look at this image corresponding on this uh, dark region on the, on the right, this is actually a fractal. And the reason why we see this irregular motion of the sequence of these chaotic systems is, what, is because it can be represented in terms of these fractal geometries when we look at these uh, uh, images. So the idea is basically that these fractal geometries can naturally give or induce this sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. And this was a very striking uh, connection that was made in the 70s and uh, this was quantified by uh, two mathematicians in the late 70s by uh, Kaplan and York, who basically connected, connected this idea of irregular motion with an underlying well-behaved uh, pattern, which is a chaotic motion, which, which is a fractal geometry. So there is a question in the chat about, would the population of the people in the world be chaos or periodic? Well, that's a good question. And I think the model to predict this would, be, would need to be a bit more uh, complicated than this. But possibly maybe in the range where it's uh, periodic or maybe just simply increasing. The moment it's increasing the population. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm just gonna finish the logistic map. I'm just gonna conclude this session by showing you uh, to connect this with uh, why do we call this the butterfly effect in the first place? So to understand this, we need to go back to the origins and go to the, the first person who actually noticed the chaotic systems when he was studying uh, simple models to predict the weather. Uh, and this was a meteorologist, American meteorologist uh, called Ed Lawrence, who was studying a simple mathematical model in application for weather forecasting. And he re uh, recognized that his model gave rise to regular and aperiodic dynamics that was very sensitive to initial conditions. I'm just gonna show you the example. That's the Lorenz, mo the Lorenz model. As you can see now it's written in terms, well, if you have never seen a differential equation, this is an example of a system of differential equations, which describes in a very simplified form, uh, some characteristics of the, uh, of, of the weather. Uh, it tries to forecast basically uh, the weather. And what he discovered uh, uh, by playing with uh, his computer and solving this numerically is that starting from initial, completely from very close initial conditions, just separated by a tiny initial disturbance, he observed that uh, this model was again leading to these completely uh, different trajectories depending on the initial condition. So here I'm showing you two different trajectories, which are separated by the order of 10 to the minus eight. As you will see that both of them, now hopefully you will be able to see two trajectories, one yellow, one blue. And this is what he observed and he realized that, well, this simple model, it's a nonlinear model. It's supposedly deterministic, but when we have a very tiny 
disturbance in the initial condition, it can lead to completely different behaviors after some time. And because he was interested in weather forecasting, he realized that tiny differences in the initial conditions, like a path of wind, could prove catastrophic in the weather prediction. And this is when he famously posed the question, does the flap of, of a butterfly's wing in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Meaning that, well, maybe just a tiny disturbance created by the flapping of the butterfly wing can be enough to change the course of your prediction, which may be, for example, predicting a storm coming somewhere in the north of America. And this tiny disturbance can, can be enough to actually induce a tornado somewhere else in the south of America. So this is when he famously summarized the concept of chaos as is chaos is when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. And the main conclusion of this is that essentially long-term weather forecasting, it's uh, very difficult, if not impossible, because it will always be very difficult to get extremely accuracy on your measurements. And this, as you can imagine, has received a lot of attention from a research point of view, and this is still a very active research topic. So I'm just, just going to conclude to summarize that we have looked at uh, three, well, mainly two or some uh, chaotic systems, the double pendulum, this logistic map, and at the end I showed you briefly this Lorentz model, and the idea that chaotic systems Important point number one is that they are deterministic. So it means that in principle, we could predict the future, but they are also highly irregular and have a strong sense of independence on the initial conditions, which basically challenges this idea of being deterministic, because if you have a tiny initial disturbance in the initial conditions, the system essentially becomes unpredictable. So with this, if you would like to uh, know more about this, uh, I recommend these two books, talk about chaos. And at this point, uh, if you have further questions, I'll be happy to answer any other questions. Well, thank you so much for that, Mark. That was a fantastic, fantastic talk. That was really, really interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions myself, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll turn off the recording for this. Um, thank you um, again, by the way, for, for coming here. I'm going to post, I'm just going to paste the link to the, um, the feedback form that's in the uh, that's on Mark's slides there. I'm just going to put that into the chat box so that it's easier to click there. But if you could um, go and uh, fill out that form, we'd be very, very grateful for doing so. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn off the recording just now. Uh, but if anybody has any questions, please send them, uh, put them in the chat box or use the Q&A button or whatever you would like.